Okay, we're going to continue talking about waves, and we're going to learn about some of the different kinds of waves that exist, and then specifically we're going to talk about sound waves, and we'll talk about some general wave properties like reflection and refraction, but we'll talk about them in the context of sound waves, and later on when we get to light, we'll talk about those same contexts as they apply to light waves. So these ideas are important not just for sound, but also for light as well. Now, the first thing that we want to talk about is the two main kinds of waves. And actually, there are lots of other kinds of waves that exist in nature. For example, if you've ever seen a flag flapping in a breeze, the wave that's traveling through the flag is something called a lamb wave. Um, there are many different kinds of waves, but the most two important kinds of waves are what we call transverse waves and longitudinal waves. Now, transverse waves are waves where the wave source, that is the thing that's vibrating, the wave source vibrates at a right angle to the direction of the wave's motion. And we'll have a picture in a minute to sort of explain what that means. But just get, get this idea down, and you can pause the video and write out this definition if you like. So, for again, for a transverse wave, the wave source vibrates at a right angle to the direction of the wave's motion. That's in contrast with a longitudinal wave. A longitudinal wave is a wave where the wave source, again, that's the thing that's vibrating and making the wave. It's the source of the wave. So for a longitudinal wave, the wave source vibrates parallel to the direction of the wave's motion. Now, just FYI, different things behave like different kinds of waves. So there's two very important examples that we're going to talk about. Transverse waves, there are other things that make transverse waves. I can, you know, shake, I can tie a rope to a wall and shake it up and down and send the waves out towards the wall, and that would be a transverse wave. But the most famous kind of transverse wave is simply light. Light is an example of a transverse wave. And so if we want to understand what light is and how light behaves, we need to understand how transverse waves behave. Now, a famous example of a longitudinal wave would be a sound wave. Sound is an example of a longitudinal wave. And so in the next slide, we're going to look at how these different types of waves are produced. And uh, I have a couple of pictures that will hopefully make all of this uh, weird mathematical definitions make more sense. And this can actually most easily be seen with a slinky. So imagine that uh, a slinky is fixed to the wall over here. And I actually do this demonstration when I teach this class in person. I just have one of my students grab a hold of the other end of the slinky and hold it. But if you vibrate the slinky back and forth, you can do it back and forth along the direction of the wave motion. So in other words, the wave's going to travel down the slinky. And so I can do that in one of two waves. I can vibrate, back, I can pulse the slinky, push back and forth on the slinky, back and forth along the line on which the wave is traveling. So the motion of vibration is parallel to the motion of the wave. Now, we can contrast this with this thing shown in part B. Here, the person grabbing hold of the edge of the slinky is shaking it up and down, but the wave is still traveling left to right. And so the, sh the vibration is at a right angle to the wave motion. In both cases, the wave is moving towards the wall, but in the longitudinal case above, we know that the thing making the wave, the thing that's vibrating, in this case, the hand shaking back and forth, is pushing and pulling along the way the wave is moving. Now, in the other case, we have what we call a transverse wave. Again, the wave's going to the right, but the thing making the wave, the hand shaking back and forth, is shaking at a right angle to the wave's motion. Now, when you have a transverse wave, that looks like what we think of as a normal wave. And all of our examples of the different parts of the wave so far have looked kind of like this. And we can even say, okay, from here to here, that would be a crest to a crest. That would be a wavelength. They've actually drawn in from a 
a trough to a trough here for this bottom wave. But actually, you have the same effect in the longitudinal wave. So the longitudinal wave, you can see when the person pushes to the right, the slinky bunches up. And when the person pulls to the left, the slinky spreads out. The bunched up part is called a condensation, and the spread out part is called a rarefaction. And I'll have those words written out in one of the other slides. But that's what's traveling as the person shakes their hand back and forth. The condensation, so he pushes forward and it sends a pulse of a condensation. He's pulling the other way, and the wave is still traveling to the right, but it's spread out more than the condensation part. So there's the rarefaction. And both of these guys are going to the right. So the condensations and the rarefactions always go in the same direction. That is, they go away from the thing making the sound. But uh, we can see that the wavelength would be the distance from the maximum compression of that condensation to the maximum compression of the condensation down further. So here we have condensation, rarefaction, condensation, rarefaction, condensation. All of these are traveling. Now with the transverse, we have the upward motion and the downward motion and the upward motion and the downward motion all traveling to the right. And from peak to peak, that's the wavelength. From peak, that is maximum compression, to peak, maximum compression, that's the wavelength. And so we can see there's a wavelength for the transverse wave as well as for the longitudinal wave. Now here we have this same idea applied to a sound wave. Now I already told you that a sound wave is a kind of a longitudinal wave. So we get that bunching up that we call the condensation and we get the sort of spreading out that we call the rarefaction. And you can see here they're labeled. The compressions or the condensations, as they're called, are the regions where air molecules have been grouped together and bunched up by the sound waves. And then the rarefactions are the place where the air is less dense. And so what you have here is you have this tuning fork is vibrating back and forth and it's generating sound down this tube. And it doesn't have to be down a tube. This could just be through the open air the same. But uh, here we have this, the, the tuning fork. It vibrates to the right and it causes the air adjacent to it to bunch up and be sort of launched down the tube. And then it vibrates in the other direction and that means the air on this side of the tuning fork gets spread out. But then it vibrates forward again and it sends another pulse of a compression or a condensation. And so these alternating condensations and rarefactions get launched down the tube. And of course, they would be traveling in the open air out in every possible direction. But we'll just confine our sort of description to the sound waves traveling to this tube because that's sort of what's shown in the picture. We can see that the condensations are very regular and so we could figure out what the wavelength would be. It would just be the distance from the middle of one to the middle of the other. That would be our wavelength for that sound wave, that longitudinal sound wave. And it's also worth noting that the, con the condensations or the compressions are traveling to the right, the rarefactions are traveling to the right, and they're all traveling together. They're moving at the same speed, in the same direction. And uh, that's noted in the caption here. It's a very important idea. They're moving in the same speed and at the same direction, both the condensations or compressions and the rarefactions. Now, this is an image that was taken from your textbook. I almost wish that instead of a microphone, it had an ear here, because it's kind of describing what's going on when you listen to the radio. But Regardless, we'll use the picture that they have, and instead of your ear, they have a microphone that's connected to an instrument called an oscilloscope. And an oscilloscope is uh, a device that can be used to measure waves. And um, a microphone is a device that converts a sound wave into an electrical signal that is then read off of the oscilloscope. Um, you could imagine a light wave coming into a digital camera 
and the digital camera could have a sensor that would convert the light wave into a signal that could go to this instrument over here as well. It doesn't really matter uh, what kind of wave you're talking about. But anyway, we'll use this example of uh, a sound wave being received by a microphone, and that sound wave is being converted into an electrical signal that's sent down this wire to this oscilloscope where it could be displayed or recorded or whatever you needed to do with that signal. So this is the loudspeaker from a radio. And what you have is uh, a radio signal, which is an electromagnetic kind of a wave, is embedded with sound information that's encoded into the wave. And it's sent through the air and it's picked up by the antenna in your car, for example. And that electrical signal is transmitted to the loudspeaker, which converts that electrical signal back into a physical vibration and so the loudspeaker vibrates back and forth and it makes sound waves. Those sound waves then travel through the air where they're picked up by this microphone and of course as I said they could be picked up by your ear as well so whatever is receiving the sound receives the sound and so the thing that we want to get across is that the electromagnetic wave of the radio wave is not the same thing as a sound wave. So what you're not actually listening to is that you're not actually listening to the radio wave. You're listening to information that's been encoded in a radio wave and then that's decoded by your car's radio and then converted into a mechanical sound wave by the loudspeaker vibrating back and forth. Now, what is it that is actually being detected by the microphone and displayed on the screen of the oscilloscope? It's the pressure from the sound wave pushing on the microphone. And so when the pressure gets bigger, you can get a much bigger sweep on your oscilloscope because that corresponds to a louder sound. And of course, also how fast the vibrations are going back and forth, that corresponds to the frequency of the sound. And that would show up as how fast the waves are vibrating back and forth. And so the two things that are uh, detected by the microphone in the wave are how big the vibrations are, that is, their amplitude, and how fast they're vibrating back and forth, that is, their frequency. And those two things together make up what the wave shape turns out to be. But I want to, I have this slide here, which is from figures taken from your textbook again, just to re-underscore this point, because this is such a common area of confusion for so many people. A radio wave is an electromagnetic wave, and therefore it travels at the speed of light. A radio receiver, that's like the radio in your car, it converts that radio wave into a mechanical wave, that is sound, and the sound wave travels about a million times slower. So again, a radio wave is not a sound wave. Now, let's talk about the speed of sound. The speed of sound in, an, in air at room temperature is about 340 meters per second. Now, sound travels at different speeds in different materials. And so, if you've ever heard someone speaking while your head was submerged underwater, you know it sounds really funny. It's because when the sound wave enters into the water and travels through the water to your ear, it actually speeds up quite a bit, and that changes how you perceive that sound. And sound travels in solid materials even faster than it does in water. So um, that's just something to be aware of, that sound will travel at different speeds in different materials. Now, one of the things that uh, is also in the slide is something that a lot of people know, but maybe some people don't. When you see lightning and you hear thunder, the thunder almost always comes after the lightning. So you see the flash of the lightning, and then you hear the thunder a few seconds later. And the reason for that is that the flash of the lightning bolt is an electromagnetic wave. Light is a form of electromagnetic wave, just like radio waves. And so it travels at the speed of light, which is about three 
hundred million meters per second. Um, the speed of sound is about 340 meters per second. So you can see that the speed of light is quite a bit faster. And so what happens is there's a flash and that light travels to your eyes and you see it, you know, almost immediately. But the sound is traveling much slower and it takes longer for it to get to your ear for you to be able to hear it. Now, we know that the speed of sound is about a thousand feet per second. It's a little bit more than that. So there's a rule of thumb that if you count all five seconds, that means that the lightning struck about a mile away. Because remember, a mile is 5,280 feet, about 5,000 feet, give or take. And so if, it, if sound travels 1,000 feet a second, a little bit more, but let's say about 1,000 feet per second, you see the flash almost immediately, but then the sound takes one second, two seconds, three, four, five seconds to get to you. That means it will have traveled about 5,000 feet, a little bit more than a mile. And so if you just simply count off seconds, you can kind of see how far away a particular lightning strike would be based on the time difference between when you see the flash and when you hear the thunderclap. The next thing that we want to talk about are the properties that sound has when it interacts with different surfaces. And one of them is called reflection and the other is called refraction. Now, most people have an idea of what reflection means. Refraction may be something new to you, but both of these are properties of sound when they interact with the surface, like bouncing off of a wall. And so we're going to look at that, uh, these two ideas. So here we have this person is in an enclosed room, and there's a loudspeaker here sending sound out. Now, some of that sound is going to go straight to the person, and they're going to hear it. But some of the sound is going to go out in another direction, but that person might still be able to hear it because that sound could bounce off the wall and get to them that way. And so that is called reflection, and reflection is when a wave bounces off of a surface. Now, there's a particular rule about reflections at a surface, and that rule is called the law of reflection. And so I've written that out here. This is the law of reflection. And what the law of reflection says is the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. In other words, this sound wave is coming in and it strikes the wall, and this line representing the sound wave, it's coming in at a particular angle to the wall, and it leaves at that same angle. So the angle from there to there would be the same as the angle from there to there, as an example. Now, this is called the law of reflection, and for each of these sound waves, when they hit the wall, they're coming in at, so this angle coming in is slightly different from that angle, but the angle it bounces off that is the same angle it's coming in with. So that's the law of reflection. At any surface, a wave that reflects off that surface will do so such that the angle of incidence, that's the incoming angle, equals the angle of reflection, the outgoing angle. Now, have you ever noticed that when you sing in the shower, you might sound a little bit better than if you're singing in an open field? Or in a certain concert hall, music might sound a little bit more full, a little bit more rich than it would if, you know, it was out in a field somewhere? This effect is due to something that we call reverberation. And reverberation is the effect of multiple reflections. And so the basic idea is this. So this loudspeaker here, or it could be a person playing a musical instrument or a person singing, they're singing and their sound waves are going out in every direction. And so if, the, if this were, instead of being a room, if this were an open field, some of the sound waves would go to that person, but most of the sound waves would go off in different directions, and this person here wouldn't hear those sound waves at all. But because he or she is in a room, what happens is some of the sound waves that normally would go off and they would never hear them, they reflect and they come back. Now, what makes the sound more full is not only that you have multiple versions of the sound wave all converging at the person, but 
they travel different distances. And so this sound wave, the one that goes straight from the speaker to the person, that's going to get there the fastest. And this one's going to get there because it travels a longer distance. It's going to have a little time lag. And so it sort of stretches the sound out. And you have these multiple reflections landing at the ear, not exactly at the same time, but pretty close. But because the ear is hearing those different versions of the sound at slightly different times, it makes the effect more full. And that is called reverberation. And by the way, there's another word that we use for reflection specifically when we're talking about sound. We don't use this word when we're talking about light, but with sound, reflections are sometimes called echoes. And so the person hears the direct sound coming from the loudspeaker, and they can also hear the sound echoing off the wall, or they hear the echoes of the sound bouncing off the wall at different places. In biology, there's a very important principle that makes use of these echoes, and it's called echolocation. And basically, echolocation uses echoes or reflections for different animals to be able to be more aware of their environment. It's most famously used by bats and dolphins. Bats, of course, uh, live in caves, which are very, very dark. And if they want to fly through the cave, they don't want to hit a stalactite or, you know, take a wrong turn. And so they can't see in the dark, but what they do is they squeak. And those squeaks send out sound waves, which bounce off the walls and then come back. And the bat's brain knows basically how long it takes for the sound wave to get to the wall and come back. And so it's able to intuit where the wall is based on how long it took the sound to go out and come back. If it takes the sound longer to go out, reflect off the wall of the cave, and then come back and be heard by the bat's ear, then that means that wall is farther away because it took the sound longer to get there and come back. Dolphins use this same principle for hunting for food. They send the sound waves out, and if there's a fish somewhere behind the dolphin, for example, the sound wave will actually bounce off that fish, come back to the dolphin, and the dolphin will know that there's a fish behind it. Even though it can't see the fish, it can turn around and go chase after it. And so dolphins use echolocation for hunting. Now, here's something that a lot of people don't know, but actually human beings, people, can learn to do echolocation just like bats and dolphins. Um, it turns out that some blind people have been doing this for years. Uh, not every blind person does this, but a lot of blind people, in order to compensate for their lack of vision, they actually learn how to do echolocation. And so sometimes if you see a blind person tapping a cane, it might be just be that they're sweeping the cane in front of them trying to make sure they're not going to trip on something. But if they're tapping the cane, they could be doing it to generate sound waves, which then bounce off things in their environment, steps and walls and fire hydrants and whatever, uh, to alert the blind person of their presence. Because those sound waves go out, they bounce off the different things in the environment and come back. And based on the time delay between those echoes and when the cane clicked on the ground, the blind person's brain is able to calculate where those things have to be. And um, it's something that adds a degree of independence to those blind people that have learned how to do it. Now, I read a news article just recently from the time I'm making this video that there was a paper published about a group of people that learned how to teach this. And not only to blind people, but they were able to teach it to sighted people as well. It took about 10 weeks for this group of people to learn how to use echolocation. So I thought that that was a really cool thing. And I just thought I'd mention it in this video because I like cool things. And in my view, that's one of them. The next thing that we want to talk about is something called refraction refraction. Now, refraction is a general wave property uh, that all waves can do. Light waves do it, sound waves do it, other kinds of waves can do it. But we're going to, because this is a chapter about sound, we're going to mainly be talking about sound waves refracting, and then we'll talk about it in the next chapter as it applies to light waves too. But what is refraction? Refraction 
is the bending of a wave as it passes from one medium into another due to a change in the wave's velocity. So let's think about sound waves and what this really means. If sound waves go from one material into another material, let's say from air into water, for example, the sound waves will be traveling at different speeds in those different materials. We've already talked about that, that sound travels at different rates in different materials. If it is incident from one material into another material and it speeds up or slows down, if that happens at an angle, when the sound travels from the one material into the second material, or we say from one medium into another medium, it will bend. Now that's kind of weird. Why does that happen? In order to explain when that happens, I have this picture of a lawnmower. And we have sort of a paved region here. So this is the sidewalk, which is pavement. And then we have a grassy region here. So you've got pavement, you've got grass, and this lawnmower. And again, we want to see why does the light wave or the sound wave or the other kind of wave refract? Why does it bend when you pass it from one material into another material? And so the key thing is that it has to be coming in at an angle. So we've got our lawnmower and you're pushing it at a steady rate on the pavement. And so it's going at a constant speed and then it hits the grass. And I think we'd all agree that when it hits the grass, it's going to slow down a little bit. But here's the thing. When it's coming in at an angle, this wheel hits the grass before that wheel. And so this side of the lawnmower slows down before that side of the lawnmower slows down and it turns. And so that's why it bends. Now, once both of the wheels, or actually all four of the wheels, are in the grass, there's no longer that difference in speed. And so it's going to keep going straight. But when it's going, when it makes a transition from the pavement side to the grass side, one part of the lawnmower slows down and the other part still goes on. This same effect can happen with a sound wave or a light wave. So imagine you've got one material and another material and you've got some kind of wave coming in. And that could be a sound wave, a light wave, any kind of wave. If it's coming in at an angle, this side of the wave hits the edge of the or the boundary between the two materials first and it slows down or speeds up first and this guy is keeping the speed he had before and so that creates this effect to make it turn and so this is why waves refract and again the the wave has to be coming in at an angle and it has to either speed up or slow down when it changes from one material to another material what would happen if the uh, lawnmower here was coming in both wheels parallel and they arrived at the same time. There would be no reason for the turning because they slow down at the same time. And so if the sound wave or the light wave is coming straight in, it just goes straight through. It doesn't bend at all. But if it's coming in at an angle, it's going to bend. And this process of bending is called refraction. Now refraction, once again, is the bending of a wave, and that's any kind of wave, as it passes from one medium into another due to a change in the wave's velocity. That is refraction. Here is a fun application of refraction, and uh, I'm going to just describe what's going on in the picture. Um, but the key point here is that cool air and warm air act almost like two different materials. But instead of there being an abrupt change, like pavement to grass, the cooler air has a slightly slower velocity than the warmer air, but it's not like there's a block of air at this temperature and a block of air at the other temperature. What happens is the cooler air is getting warmer. Every, la every layer of air gets warmer as you go up. So there's more of a smooth, continuous change in temperature. And so here in the picture, you have the sleeping dog and you have the trumpet player playing a note on his trumpet. 
And this is a case, maybe this is at noon. And so the pavement's really warm because the sunlight's shining on it. And so the air near the pavement is warmer than the air above the pavement. And so the higher up you go, the cooler the air gets. But where the sun is shining on the pavement, the air is really warm. And so what happens, remember, the speed of sound is different for different temperatures of air. And the way it's going to work is that the sound is going to refract through these different layers of air, and it's going to bend upward. And so the sleeping dog won't even hear the trumpet play because the air refracts upward over it, and it doesn't even hear the sound waves. Now, if you were, for example, at midnight where the ground is very, very cold and the air above it is warmer, here the sound is going to refract in the other direction, and so the trumpet player plays and the sound waves refract downward and startle the dog and wake the poor dog up. But both of these are a bending of the sound wave caused by this principle of refraction. And it has to do with the fact that at different temperatures of air, the sound is moving at different speeds, and that creates this bending effect. Now, here's something that most people are familiar with. They've seen it uh, in movies. You may have uh, seen it in real life. Uh, this is a sonogram, which is made by sending ultrasound into the belly of a pregnant, pregnant woman. And what happens is the sound passes through. It interacts with the baby of the pregnant woman, and it reflects and it refracts at different places. And the differences caused by these reflections and ref, ref, refractions are then picked up by a microphone which is sensing the time delays and that enables a computer to generate a picture of what's inside. And so this is actually a sonogram of the daughter or possibly granddaughter of the author Hewitt. So this is a picture that has a personal connection to the author of our textbook. But in any case, this is another application of the reflection and the refraction of sound.